now, America's number one show on pop culture and politics. This is the Michael Medved Show. And another great day in this greatest nation on God's green earth. And the nation is so great and our natural splendor is so great. If you ever go to national parks, if you ever travel around, and I know it's late for that. It's after Labor Day, so... People are doing a little bit less traveling, but one of the things that you're still able to do in the country, for instance, you see the leaves in the autumn, uh, which is on its way, and you think, man, there's a pattern here. There's some design in nature. Is that uh, ever something that uh, human beings might want to think? Well, yeah, but just so long as you don't even mention that in any uh, academic setting at Ball State University in Indiana... You've heard all about university speech codes. They're always obnoxious. They're always ridiculous. The notion that in, of all places, a university where ideas are supposed to battle one another and duel one another, and you're supposed to come up with the truth through this whole idea of thesis and antithesis and then synthesis, right? That's the whole idea. Not when it comes to the notion of design and nature. So what is is going on with this assault on free speech. That's the subject of this special science and culture hour with uh, our friends and associates from Discovery Institute. It's my great pleasure to be joined by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Stephen Meyer, who is the uh, director of Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. He's a Ph.D., of course, from Cambridge University over on the other side of the pond, And uh, he's the author of the best-selling book, the New York Times bestseller, Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origins of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. Stephen, great to have you here. It's great to be with you again, Michael. Well, thank you. Okay, we have all followed a little bit this case uh, at Ball State of a um, a physicist who was busted uh, for um, basically by people outside the university, not by his own students, for suggesting that there might be elements of design in nature. What is this latest development? Because it sounds almost like a joke. Well, as you know, initially he was teaching a course about the boundaries of science. This uh, is Professor Eric Pre- Hedin. Pre- Professor Eric Hedin. And a group from outside the university, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, objected, <laughs> started pressuring the university. By the way, that foundation, it's about... 12 people? It's it's a minor player, except that they're having an outsized influence. And they went after this professor, tried to get the university to uh, lean on him to cease and desist. His great thought crime was not that he was actually teaching the theory of intelligent design. He just had some books about it listed in a syllabus. Some of the books were pro and some were anti. So it was a completely balanced syllabus. But in any case, they went after this guy. Uh, The university caved to the pressure, appointed an ad hoc committee to evaluate his teaching methods. Some of the members of the ad hoc committee, it turns out, were hyper-partisans who who had already written public statements denouncing intelligent design. And, uh, And so this professor's fate hangs in the balance. In the meantime, the president of the university has issued... A, a speech code, a gag order, on the science faculty at the university saying that there will be no discussion of the idea of design in nature, of the theory of intelligent design in any science classroom at the university. And, in fact, she justified this in the name of academic freedom. So you have this new Orwellian definition of academic freedom, which is the freedom to, to affirm any idea so long as it does not divert from the consensus. One eight hundred nine five five seventeen seventy six is our phone number. If um, you think it's appropriate for academic authorities to suppress discussions of design in nature, uh, then uh, give us a call because uh, Steve would like to speak with you. So would I. One eight hundred nine five five seventeen seventy six is our phone number. Let me get this straight because. I, it, it, it seems so remarkable. The, the idea of, of uh, viewing nature and seeing some sense of design, some sense of, of purpose, or it, it's so basic to the human condition. She really used in her speech code the, the question of design in nature. It's not just uh, a repression of the notion of intelligent well, design? Well, she, she said the theory of intelligent design, but the theory of intelligent design, as you correctly pointed out at the beginning of the hour, is about the perception of design in nature. And, and, and I think this is what a lot of people don't understand. They think the question of intelligent design is somehow 
really exotic or extraneous to the scientific discourse. But this goes back to the ancient Greeks who debated whether there was a, a, a mind that shaped matter or whether matter could shape itself. It goes back to the period of the scientific revolution where scientists thought that they could study nature because it was intelligible, and it was intelligible because it had been designed by an intelligent creator. And it goes back to Darwin, who's, who was trying to explain the appearance of design in living organisms without reference to an actual designing intelligence. So the, the question of design, whether it's real or just an illusion, is hard-baked into biology. It's part of the subject. And it, it, so, of course, it's a natural question for people to want to discuss in a class in science. And Hadeen's class wasn't even a straight-up science class. It was a philosophy of science class. This is a, a, a kind of a deep question, and you have the doctorate in philosophy of science, so uh, <laughs> you're the right guy to ask. How can you possibly draw a distinction or put a limit if you're seeking patterns in nature, which is part of what a whole series of sciences are supposed to be looking at is patterns in nature? How do you seek patterns without acknowledging some form of design? Well, that has been one of the, the indicators of design historically, is especially certain types of in, intricate patterns. And what we've now done in our modern work on intelligent design is show that there are distinctive indicators of intelligence, in particular when the patterns are information-rich. We invariably, in all realms of experience, recognize design immediately and intuitively. If you look at the Rosetta Stone, when you go into the British Museum, you don't say, hey, isn't it wonderful what wind and erosion produced? <laughs> you see those inscriptions, you realize that those are you know, expressions of, of language in, th in three different languages, and the archaeologists immediately concluded that there was a scribe not a, uh, with a mind, not a, a strictly material process. So certain types of patterns are decisive indicators of intelligence. And, and particularly the DNA patterns that we've discovered recently. That, and, and that's what you know, my, my two books have been about, is the, the, these in, big infusions of information that occur in the history of life. We know from experience that information always arises from an intelligent source, whether we're talking about a hieroglyphic inscription at the, on the Rosetta Stone or digital code in a computer uh, setting or information in, in a book or, or, or newspaper article, if you trace information back to its source, you always come to an intelligence, to a mind, not a material process. And so uh, it's quite natural that scientists, having discovered that information is at the foundation of life, that it is crucial to its origin and, and maintenance, that they would be curious as to whether the design that is apparent there is real or, or just an appearance. That's, that's the big question in biology. Did you see, I'm sure you did, Stephen, the, um, the, there was a New York Times piece, uh, I believe it was earlier this week, about Eugenie Scott, and uh, who has dedicated her life to defeating what she calls creationism. Now, she insists on calling you a creationist. Or they'll sometimes conjoin that uh, the, they'll call us intelligent design creationists or creationists in cheap tuxedos or I I anything <laughs> but engaging the argument. I've never <laughs> seen you in a cheap tuxedo or any tuxedo <laughs> yeah, over that exactly. matter. But OK, so um, can just make clear one time more for everyone sure. what the difference is, why it. And by the way, Eugenie Scott, apparently it's a tremendous amount of money that she's able to raise and. Her entire reason for being, as the Times made clear, is to discredit uh, people like Dr. Stephen Meyer. She's the, she is the head of the Darwin-only science lobby known as the National Center for Science Education. It's a small outfit, but they've been successful raising money for their efforts. And two of their affiliates are on this committee evaluating Hadeen's teaching methods. So you've oh, got wait, the... wait, wait. They have two of the people who are, uh, who are affiliated with the science education? Eugenie Scott? You've got the, 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 the fox minding the, the chicken coop here in this case. Yeah, they, they have, there are people who are, have affiliations with the National Center for Science Education who are on this committee. They're also faculty members at the university, but, but NCSE has these connections around the country. Well, that would be like, uh, I, I don't know, having a, um, a member of Operation Push or, or the National Action Network on the uh, – uh, uh, Trayvon Martin, you, George Zimmerman's jury, just to use an example. I mean, you talk about people who are who are going to be predetermined to find Eric Hadeen guilty. These are hyper partisans evaluating his teaching methods and deciding his fate. Let's uh, let's go to Joe in Cincinnati. Joe, you're on the Michael Medved show with Dr. Meyer. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I'm a science teacher in Ohio, and I'd like to say that. I believe that there is a designer, okay, but the theories of intelligent design aren't 
science because you basically are making conclusions that because there are gaps in natural theories, that that, la- that lacking supports what you're saying is the only alternative. Okay, hold on. Keep that thought, Joe. Don't go away. I'm going to put you on hold. I want you to engage with Stephen Meyer. This is the Science and Culture Hour talking about should people in school be allowed to debate design in nature? More coming up. 1-800-955-1776. The Michael Medved Show. On the Michael Medved Show, it is 21 minutes uh, after the hour, joined by uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer, who is the director of the Center for Science and Culture of Discovery Institute. And uh, you don't need uh, some kind of sensational discovery to find a great deal on a brand new car. You can do it easily at autotrader.com. You compare prices and special offers on all new cars from local dealers, autotrader.com the ultimate new car marketplace. Let's go back to Joe in Cincinnati, who is a science teacher, who, um, uh, Joe, when when you, we were talking before, we were talking about this tendency to um, basically forbid any discussion about ideas of intelligent design and design in nature on a college campus. Uh, you don't believe that intelligent design is science, but would you support uh, rules that would make it impossible for teachers or, or students, for that matter, to discuss ideas of intelligent design? No, I wouldn't support that. And in fact, you mentioned that the college class in Indiana was a philosophy of science class. That's the perfect forum for the discussion. I, I took philosophy of science and religion classes when I was in college, getting my engineering degree before I turn to education. That's the perfect forum for it. But what's the problem with intelligent designers is that they have long adopted a wedge strategy. They really aren't interested in advocating the science of education design. They're interested in advocating religion. That was found back in the 1982 case in Arkansas. Then okay, can, well, can, we, can, can we give us Steve Meyer a chance to respond, and I'll get you yeah, a chance let, let me, to respond Let me back. go right to his most substantive claim, that intelligent design isn't science. Actually, intelligent design hadn't been formulated in 1982, so some of your facts are wrong. But let me just lay out the, the, the argument here. In, in, I show this in my new book, Darwin's Doubt, that in making the case for intelligent design, um, I make the case based on certain evidence that's been found, the digital code that's stored in DNA, the circuitry that's necessary to build animal forms, uh, the hierarchical, hierarchically organized forms of information that are involved in animal life. And I I make the case also using a standard method of scientific reasoning. This is not an argument from ignorance. It's not just a critique of Darwinism. It's an argument, uh, it's a, I use a standard method of scientific reasoning called inference to the best explanation, which Darwin himself used in The Origin of Species. And Darwin had a principle of reasoning that he also used, uh, uh, which was uh, called the vera causa principle. And the idea is that when you're trying to explain an event in the remote past, you should look for causes that are now in operation, causes that are known to produce the effect in question. Well, as I was studying that in grad school, I asked myself the question, what is the cause now in operation that produces digital code, that produces circuitry? And the answer from our uniform and repeated experience is intelligence. So what we know from experience should illuminate what we think is the best explanation of events in the past. And what we know from experience is that it takes a mind to produce functional information, digital code. It takes a mind to produce circuitry. And so the kind of evidence we're finding in biology points back to an intelligent cause, and it does so using Darwin's own method of scientific reasoning. If the case for intelligent design is unscientific, then I would submit that Darwin's uh, method of reasoning and his case in The Origin of Species is unscientific because the two, the argument for intelligent design and against intelligent design, use the same scientific method. 
Uh, Joe? Friends, uh, writings by themselves had a lot of lacking in in terms of how scientific they were. If they hadn't been supported by so many things since then, they wouldn't have been able to be accepted. No, no this isn't really a matter of the evidence. Uh, the evidence has changed, and there's a lot that we've discovered that Darwin didn't know. You're right, and that's one of the reasons that there is such a strong case for intelligent design to be made now. But typically, philosophers of science try to define, come up with definitions of science based on the methods that are used in science. And the point is, if, you're, if intelligent design is using a standard method of scientific reasoning, the very one that's used by other evolutionary biologists, including all the way back to Darwin himself, then there really is no grounds for excluding intelligent design by definition from the from consideration as a scientific theory. It could be refuted by the evidence, but simply saying, well, it's not scientific by some abstract definition is, is really just another way to silence proponents of an idea rather than engaging the arguments. And so by affirming that principle, it's sometimes called methodological naturalism or materialism, you, you really are inadvertently just uh, uh, affirming another speech code that prevents scientists from considering where the evidence most naturally leads. Uh, Joe, can I ask you a question? You there? You're saying that the lack of evidence for one explanation becomes evidence for the other. No, that's exactly what I'm that's not saying. No, no, no. dualism. No, 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 it's Joe. Science. Joe, you're 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 missing the point. Can can I ask you a question very directly? Have you yeah. ever read any of Dr. Meyer's work? Not 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 Dr. Meyer's work, but I did some extensive research for some of my pedagogy classes about intelligent design. I found it a very interesting subject because, as I said, I accept much of what you assert, but to assert that it's science okay, and no, no, wait, but is wrong. Michael, can I jump back in Please. On, yeah, on this one point? about the, You're saying it's an argu- what's called in philosophy or logic an argument fi- from ignorance, and an argument from, ig- in ig- from ignorance in this case would, be, would have the following form. Natural selection and random mutations don't seem to be capable of producing, for example, the information you need to build a Cambrian animal. Therefore, it was designed. That would be an argument from ignorance. But that's not how I'm arguing. I'm not arguing that one type of cause is insufficient, therefore another must necessarily be true. I'm arguing that natural selection and ran- random mutation aren't sufficient to produce the information you need to build a Cambrian animal, but there is a cause of which we know that is capable of building the kind of information that we see arising in the history of life, in the Cambrian period, for example. And that cause is intelligence. And we know that from experience, our uniform and repeated experience, the basis of all scientific reasoning. So I'm arguing that based on what we know, not what we don't know, intelligent design is the best ex- explanation for that explosion of information that occurs uh, in, in the history of life. But Joe, you, I, you get the last word here. Science's ability to explain all that you've said. You're asserting that science can't explain it, but you're wrong. Well, on talk it's radio, very, I'm asserting it. Technical. <laughs> yeah. And I know that ID, ID people like to ignore the evidence that explains much of what you're asserting can't be explained scientifically. Well, well, on talk I'm radio, I'm making it's assertions. Too but much to go into here. Well, that's but right. So I, what, let me recommend that you have a look at. Let me recommend that you have a look at the book I've written, Darwin's Doubt. I, have, uh, I, I present five separate evidentially-based and mathematically rigorous critiques of the creative power of the neo-Darwinian mechanism with respect to its ability to produce functional biological information. And it's, I think you should have a look at that before you decide that this is just an assertion and not a, an evidentially backed-up argument. And, and, and Joe, this is, this is one of those fundamental things that I think people use to smear uh, ID. And basically saying that ID is uh, uh, another form of creationism. You can read Darwin's Doubt, and it is not emphatically not a religious tract. It is a, a, a piece of work that takes a look at some of the most recent scientific information, information that was not available to Charles Darwin and has not been available in prior generations, that suggests that uh, the patterns discernible in nature could only be and are, in fact, based upon the best logical chain of evidence, based upon intelligence. Now, speaking of intelligence, there's another case in Texas, of all places, in a community college, with attempts to shut down this kind of conversation that we've just had. We'll get to that and more coming up. Michael Medved. SRN News. I'm Rich Thomason in Washington. 
A Senate panel has voted to give President Obama authority to use military force against Syria in response to a deadly chemical weapons attack. The full Senate expected to vote on that resolution next week. Bradley Manning, the former Army intelligence analyst, serving a 35-year sentence for sending reams of classified information to WikiLeaks, asking for a presidential pardon. The latest Federal Reserve Beige Book survey finds that economic growth held steady across the country July through late August. Americans were buying more cars and homes, and auto factories added workers. August was a good month for auto sales. The automakers recording double-digit gains. That helped Wall Street go higher today. The Dow is up 97 points. The Nasdaq closed 36 points higher. More details at srnnews.com. I found a small lump. It just didn't feel right. After a biopsy, I was told that it was cancer. Last year, Kimalea Conrad was diagnosed with stage 2 breast cancer. I was devastated. and I felt alone. I began praying, God, how do I do this? Where do I do this? Cancer Treatment Centers of America was the place. At Cancer Treatment Centers of America, faith and spiritual support play an important role in the fight against complex and advanced stage cancer. When I walk in to CTCA, it it feels like a place of life and hope. Advanced medicine and technology, the warm embrace of the spirit and the power of prayer. That's Cancer Treatment Centers of America, a national network of five cancer hospitals. I am so grateful and so blessed that I went to the Cancer Treatment Centers of America. I am strong and I am joyous. If you or a loved one has complex or advanced stage cancer, visit cancercenter.com forward slash faith. Cancer Treatment Centers of America, care that never quits. Appointments available now. What if someone invented a way to find the perfect brand new car that didn't involve driving from new car dealership to new car dealership? Well, Autotrader.com did. By searching our immense inventory of actual new cars for sale, you can see which dealers have the exact 2013 sedan you want. Plus, see who has the best price and compare offers in your area like cashback or low APR. So you can find which dealership has your perfect car and the best deal before ever leaving the house. Autotrader.com, the ultimate new car marketplace. Police called and broke the bad news to Charles. His personal and financial information was found on an identity thief's computer disk. Nervous and confused, Charles called LifeLock, the industry leader in identity theft protection. LifeLock went into action, uncovering multiple fraudulent credit applications the identity thief was trying to open in his name. LifeLock shut them down and helped him restore his good name and credit. Charles found out the hard way that identity theft is a global crime, a crime that's become so complex you simply can't fight it alone your personal and financial information is everywhere don't wait for a call from the police before you take action visit lifelock.com now or call and mention promo code medved to get a special 10 percent discount call 1-800-921-3790 1-800-921-3790 1-800-921-3790 see lifelock.com for details network does not cover all transactions and scope may vary I want my company's network to be safer and more reliable. Do you want to deal with multiple vendors? No. Are per-user fees and added feature costs okay? No. How about solutions that are hard to install and use? No. Offshore or automated phone tree support okay? No. Then yes, we can help. Barracuda Networks offers the largest family of powerful, affordable security, networking, and storage solutions designed to protect business users, apps, and data. All from a single source that's easy to do business with. Protect your business. Visit barracuda.com slash products to try any free for 30 days. Four minutes after the hour on the Medved Show, where it's easy to save 15% or even more on car insurance with GEICO. Just go to GEICO.com or call 1-800-947-AUTO. And the only hard part, figuring out which way is even easier. And it's easy to see why Stephen Meyer has um, emerged as one of the most popular, most read, most influential science writers in the United States. He is. He's also the director of the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute. He's a Ph.D. from Cambridge. And, uh, Steve, we were talking before about the efforts in Indiana at the university level, major public university, to suppress discussion of patterns in nature, of of design in nature. 
And uh, what about this case in Amarillo, Texas? Well, it's another unfortunate but uh, similar case. Uh, There's a community college in Amarillo that was going to offer, a course, a philosophy class as a course for personal enrichment, not part of any established curriculum, uh, on the debate over intelligent design and the debate between intelligent design and neo-Darwinism. The course was, this was in the philosophy department. It was a, a philosophy class, and it was uh, to be offered. A group called, and I kid you not, you can't make this stuff up, Michael, the Free Thought Oasis uh, goes after the university, starts pressuring them. And the university uh, reported that they received many, many angry communications from these people, and they withdrew the course because they were concerned about threatened disruptions of the course. So these folks were able, in the name of free thought, to shut down discussion and free thought and uh, who, who are who are who is the free thought again oasis? a small ma- marginal group of r- a radically secularist group who wants no discussion of any idea that might have even any theistic implications and so they have uh, prevented students at this college from uh, having this open discussion that is really as you say part of the glory of colleges and universities to explore ideas and to test them uh, one against the other Let's uh, go to Paul in Woodenville, Washington. You're on the Medved Show with Dr. Stephen Meyer. Thank you for taking my call, Michael. I am so glad to start, uh, to be able to uh, finally be able to talk to Dr. Meyer. I've heard you on several shows, this, uh, this show a couple of times, and I heard you talking with Tom Hartman one time a couple of weeks ago. So I didn't I'm get to talk to with Tom to that finally, much. finally uh, get to talk to you. Uh, I... Uh, my, my first advanced degree was in biological sciences, so I think I'm equipped to discuss this issue. Um, I've heard you say some things that are factually incorrect, and, but I do have one question uh, philosophically for you. Uh, how do you know that the, the, the intelligence you're recognizing in a design is one other than your own? In other words, it's a reflection. You talk about uh, designs always lead back to some kind of intelligence, but they always lead back to a human intelligence. There's not one example that you provided that leads back to another intelligence. Well, in the case of life, we know that it was not my, uh, that life was not designed by my intelligence because I know I didn't design it. I observed the the, uh, the object separate from myself. I, well, you, you, just, Paul, I don't really understand what you're trying to say. Are you are you saying that intelligent design? Must suggest that human beings designed all of life. No, no. Now, you, now you're no. I'm saying that in te- what you're recognizing is an intelligent is a is a psychological construct. Just as the musical scale do re mi fa sol la ti do is nothing. There's nothing natural about it. Is it is a correct it is a, it right is a psychological right. Okay, construct good. So we, as humans here, uh, as something that's natural to our ears, but it is not. There's nothing natural about it. Uh, dogs don't recognize it, and certainly we, when we listen okay. To so wait, cultures, wait, wait, wait. So what? What? What, what, what are you? What are you? What are you saying? There's nothing natural about life. <laughs> no, don't be ridiculous. Uh, let, let, um, me, let me let me jump in here, Paul. Um, the the your, I think your analogy breaks down in that we're not talking about something like the scale. We're talking about something like a sheet of Mozart's music, and we and when we're when we look at the information that's embedded in DNA, we know something from our cause and effect our experience of cause and effect in the world around us that allows us to make an inference from that information-rich structure back to the kind of cause that we see in every other realm of experience producing information, and that cause is intelligence. You're right. We don't attempt to identify the intelligence using that method of scientific reasoning. That's a matter for further philosophical deliberation. But using a standard method of scientific reasoning, as I mentioned in the last hour, the very one that Darwin used, uh, we can infer that an intelligence played a role, and there was an intelligent cause separate from the effect that produced that information-rich inf- effect, which is embedded in the DNA molecule and in other places in, in living organisms. Paul, you get the last word very quickly. Uh, certainly, Anselm of Canterbury and Thomas Aquinas, Immanuel Kant, and David Hume would argue with you in favor of what I have just said, that uh, you cannot recognize God's intelligence. Uh, what Thomas Aquinas said in about uh, the 12th century and if you're uh, undoubtedly familiar with Anselm's argument for the existence of God. We okay, we will, get, we will get a response from uh, Stephen Meyer to Thomas Aquinas and St. Anselm. Uh, coming right up, this Science and Culture Hour. 1-800-955-1776. The Michael Medved Show.
34 minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show, where the response of uh, so many of you to um, our special broadcast on Labor Day about World War I and the fateful American decision to enter World War I, a decision that uh, remains controversial to this day. That was the subject of our special Medved history program, which uh, aired on Labor Day. And because of the response to that program and your general response to the Medved History Store, everything, all of the products, all of the packages in the Medved History Store, which already save you money, now available till uh, the 9th of September at 20% off. Go to medvedhistorystore.com. And for a lot of people who uh, have heard about the Jewish holidays and wonder kind of what's going on with Judaism, we do have a history program on uh, truths and uh, myths about the Jewish religion and the Jewish faith. You can check that out at medvedhistorystore.com, everything 20% off uh, till September 9th. Now, speaking of truths and and faiths um, and uh, truths and fakes and myths, uh, Stephen Meyer is with us. Stephen, the author of the best-selling book, uh, Darwin's Doubt, it is posted up at our website at michaelmedved.com. It's a New York Times bestseller and a a fascinating, highly readable, very persuasive account of um, some of the gaps in Darwinian thought and uh, some of the intelligent design alternatives. Our last caller, Paul in Woodenville, was trying to make the case that uh, great religious philosophers have said that we cannot comprehend divine intelligence, that God ultimately is unknowable. So how does that compute with your insistence that you have identified an intelligent designer in the universe? Well, first of all, Thomas Aquinas, who was cited, is well known for his five ways of knowing God. They were philosophical arguments that did conclude with the the, uh, affirmation of God's existence. So that was, I think, factually false. But we're not trying to prove that God exists. We're trying to show that an intelligence of some kind is the best explanation for certain features of biological systems. And uh, the caller was saying that the, the conclusion of design is just in the mind of the beholder, that it's just a subjective projection of our, uh, the way our minds work onto nature. But uh, we wouldn't say that, actually, in any other realm of experience or in many realms of experience where we detect design. If we go on your website today, Michael, and look at the descriptions in in English of today's programming, no one would say, oh, gee, that information is something that I'm pers- I'm imposing on the screen. They'd realize that, no, there was another mind behind that information that wrote it. And that's the pattern of inference that we make universally in encountering the world around us. And we do that because of what we know about what it takes to produce information, We know what we know about cause and effect. So the design is in the mind of the beholder objection. I don't think it really works. Let's go to Brian in Louisville, Kentucky. You're on the Michael Medved Show with Dr. Stephen Meyer. Hey, Michael. Thanks for taking my call. You bet, Brian. Listen, I have been listening to uh, Stephen Meyer all over the conservative talk radio circuit. And I I want to address you and Stephen, since both you all are very intelligent men. It basically comes down to one thing and one thing only because we're going to distill all these arg- – we're going to take away all these arguments that we're having right now, and we're going to distill it down to one thing for all your listeners. And that is, is that your theory is based on the lack of evidence for evolution creating the organisms that we have today. Is that correct? No, and it's the same point I made to the early, minute, earlier you caller. You have, you have said that in the Cambrian, the Cambrian explosion – Okay. Prior to that, in the strata, there was nothing to indicate that something would evolve to the organisms that were created with such complexity in the Cambrian period. Is that not correct? Because that's what you have said. I've listened to you on Dennis Miller the other night. You said that. Well, that's part of the argument of the book, but it's not the basis of the positive case for intelligent design. The case for intelligent design is not based just on the fact that the neo-Darwinian mechanism of mutation and selection is incapable of producing the kind of digital code and circuitry that is necessary to build animals, nor is it based on the absence of ancestral fossils. It's based on also on our positive knowledge 
of what it takes to generate digital and other forms of information. What we know from experience, from our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning about the past, is that it takes a mind to produce information. So when we find information and we see that in the Cambrian event there was an explosion of new information, the most logical thing to conclude is that an intelligence played a role in the history of that event and the history of life. Brian? Fill in the gap. Do you understand? No, that's not a gap. That is positive knowledge of cause and effect. From You're missing something very important. From what we have now important. in the strata, from what we have found around the Earth, because, Stephen, you and I can agree that you have based all this on earthly evidence, and we have not found the missing link between uh, the beginning of life and now, and therefore you're assuming that there was an okay, intelligence well, could, uh, Brian, that came into play. Brian, can I ask you a question? If you're not basing a scientific conclusion on earthly evidence, what the hell are you basing it on? Earthly evidence. Well, exactly, which is what Stephen bases his conclusion on. The yeah, evidence but see, is here. The thing. He, but he's, he's, he's filling in the gap with an intelligent design theory. My, my suggestion is that if he's a true scientist, he's going to do what anthropologists and archaeologists have done since the beginning of their discipline, and that is look for evidence. And they have found evidence for human evolution in every 10 to 20 years. It keeps getting pushed back millions and millions of years based on what we found in the strata. Okay, I is Stephen Meyer? Went, just a quick not question. Enough time has passed yeah. to find the missing link, and okay. you, are, you are jumping to conclusions. Steve, Stephen Meyer? Well, I, I took I looked at seven different attempts to solve the problem of the missing ancestral fossils. But again, that's not the basis of the positive argument for design. The positive argument for design is based on what we know about what it takes to to generate information. Was it a uh, uh, an argument from ignorance uh, for the archaeologists who discovered the Rosetta Stone to conclude that it had been uh, produced by a human scribe with a mind? In other words, if you find something. And like all of the fossils in the Cambrian period, that uh, clearly, clearly suggests that it was designed, why is it somehow illogical to assume that it was designed? We will be right back. Portions of the Michael Medved Show are brought to you in part by the Discovery Institute. To learn more, click on the Science and Culture banner at michaelmedved.com. Five minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show, uh, read all about Stephen Meyer's book, or better yet, read the book. Uh, it's called Darwin's Doubt. It, um, it It's fascinating reading, even if you don't think you want to pick up a science book. This is the one you want to get. It's also great for gift giving. It's uh, featured on our website at michaelmedved.com. Stephen, one of the things that's so striking to me is with the passion that this subject always generates, why would anyone want to cut off this kind of conversation in a community college classroom or a university classroom, anywhere where ideas are exchanged? It's the most fascinating question. Uh, it's, and it's a, it's a scientific question, but it's one that has profound worldview implications, however you answer it. Every worldview has to answer the question, what is the thing or the entity or the process from which everything else came? Darwinism speaks to that question by proposing a purely materialistic answer. Intelligent design suggests that there is a purpose of intelligence. It's a fascinating discussion and right to the heart of what it means to be human. Let's go to Alan in Chicago. Alan, thanks for hanging on. You're on the MedVed Show with Dr. Meyer. Hello, Dr. Meyer. Um, I'd like to ask a little bit about whether an idea is scientific. And um, my understanding as a layperson, is that the main philosopher for determining what is scientific or not was Karl Popper in the early 20th century. And basically he said that you can never prove anything in science. You can only fail to disprove it. Examples would be Newton's laws of motion, which were eventually, uh, which eventually break down under relativity, and relativity may or may not break down under quantum mechanics. But Okay, get to the core question. Okay, so... Um, Popper says, basically, in order for something to be scientific, you must design experiments that attempt to falsify or disprove your theory. And then when those continue to fail, then you establish something as being scientific. Great question. The question is, yeah, what experiments right. could you use, uh, Stephen, to prove or test 
intelligent design. Well, let me say, let me say something I think more fundamental, which is that Popper's standard has been rejected by philosophers of science as a, an accurate definition of how science works, because while it applies to some branches of science, which can study events under controlled laboratory conditions, it doesn't apply to historical sciences like evolutionary biology, archaeology, forensics, and the like. Paleontology. Paleontology, exactly. So there's a different method of scientific reasoning that's used in those fields, and that's the very method of reasoning that I use in making the case for intelligent design. It's called the, the, the method of inference to the best explanation or the method of multiple competing hypotheses. Uh, could, couldn't you say that one experiment that could test intelligent design would be equipping a, a whole bunch of the world's leading scientists with the challenge of creating an animal? Well, absolutely. There are theories, there are experiments being that, that test intelligent design. Some experiments recently that have come out about the so-called junk DNA have confirmed a prediction of intelligent design. So intelligent design does make predictions, but the Popper standard of falsification is not universally applicable in science, and the standard that is more widely applicable applies to intelligent design. Stephen Meyer, the author, the book, Darwin's Doubt. Check it out at our website at michaelmedved.com. And thank you, as always, for your contributions to this greatest nation on God's green earth.